We know many of you here today will have contributed to our crowdfunder and our heartfelt thanks go to every one of you. We couldn't have done it without you. We are at the start of a long but exciting journey and we hope that you will continue to follow us on the way and what we hope is a real success story to show what is possible when we come together. I would now like to hand over to the team who will give you a snapshot of what has been achieved since our last update and a flavour of what is to come. Over to you, Angela. Thanks, John. Um, I'm going to start off by just doing a little bit of a introduction to meet the team. Um, so you can see our, our faces here for everybody. Um, this is the whole team working on the Taras Valley Nature Reserve. And on our left, we have Inigo, who is our digital media manager. He joined the team at the end of last year, moving up from London with his family. Jane, um, some of you may know already from uh, the Woodland Trust, and she works as an outreach advisor and provides support for us. Joyce is the office manager. Um, she keeps us all in check and makes sure that the whole office runs um, effectively, both for the Langham Initiative and also for the Taras Valley Nature Reserve project. I'm Angela Williams, I'm the development manager, and we also have Kat. Um, Kat runs our volunteer and education activities, a really important part of our work. Jenny is our estate manager. And last, but by no means least, we have William, who is um, our shepherd, and he joined us last November when we purchased the Northern Estate. So that's a welcome to the team. I'm just going to give a very, very quick snapshot of um, what's happened since we did our first webinar. Um, so anybody who took part in the first webinar, you'll know the story of the first buyout and how much we raised. Um, in the last year, we have taken ownership of the second um, of the Northern Estate, 5,300 acres, and we raised a further 2.2 million to do that. Um, we took ownership in last November, and we're now the proud owner of 10,500 acres in total, six homes, three development properties, and over a thousand sheep. But as anyone who's gone through this process knows, the hard work really starts now. Day-to-day -day running of a reserve, all the essential activities such as insurance and finance, that's just going to be a constant as we move on. But what you're going to hear about tonight is to hear about our approach, our plans for the future, and also how you can get involved. So I'd now like to hand over to Jenny, the estate manager, who will tell you a little bit more about our approach. Thanks, Ange. Um, so just on the next slide, um, I'm going to be uh, just give a really quick overview for the people that um, maybe might be new on this webinar about what we're trying to achieve. Um, so just a quick recap on that before we go on. So we've got four pillars that under, underpin um, what we're trying to achieve through community ownership um, through the development of the Taras Valley Nature Reserve. This is what we've committed to do through our buyouts um, and, work, and um, what we'll work towards uh, under community ownership. And this is almost like our skeleton starting point as we uh, now plan what's next. Um, so number one, uh, people, obviously people are at the heart of of what we're doing um, without the power of people we wouldn't be here uh, with such big ambitions for the future uh, we definitely would not have been able to achieve everything we have to date without um, you know everybody that's got behind us and supported what we're trying to do um, so you know the number one aim in terms of people is that we want to create a diverse community resource to aid regeneration um, empower and reconnect people with the land and with nature um, through a sort of nature-based approach. Um, so number two is nature. Uh, so obviously Taras Valley Nature Reserve, our key aim um, for this uh, objective, this pillar uh, is large scale ecosystem restoration. Um, working across at landscape scale um, to create large interconnected networks of habitat and looking at where we can um, restore degraded and lost habitats across um, the entire river valley. Uh, the Taras River Valley. Uh, number three, climate. So we've got some of our peatlands pictured there. Um, so owning land uh, does come with power and it does come 
with responsibility. So for us, that means um, the power to make a meaningful um, contribution to the climate emergency uh, and also uh, for the benefit of our community, but also looking at that national, um, you know, that national emergency response and um, doing our bit to create a brighter and fairer future on a sort of national level as well. Um, we're really serious about climate change and we, you know, we're really keen to sort of be um, an inspiring initiative for um, showing how communities can make a real difference, um, you know, on the ground with the climate crisis um, and sustainability. So that's number four, underpinning it all. I mean, these are very interlinked themes. It's quite hard to sometimes break them all out because they are so interlinked. Um, but obviously this, this one is about balancing people, planet, profit. Um, to ensure that a really rich legacy is left for future generations. Um, we're really keen with how we develop things going forward, that we provide new opportunities for people and help to support wider regeneration efforts in Langham. I'll go on to our community approach next. Um, so just to start this slide um, about our community-led approach, we think this uh, quote underpins it all. It's taken a while for it to load for me. Ah, there we go. Um, so we think this quote underpins it all. Nothing done to us without us is for us. Um, and we want people to be involved and shape this um, in the ways that suit them. Um, you know, the usual approach we've probably all seen far too often uh, across all areas of life is that plans are developed in the background um, and then um, announced with not much room for changes and sort of not much room for a collaborative approach to developing things. And we want to really show the benefits of doing things differently and um, through a collaborative and participative um, engagement approach as we go forward. Um, so engagement will never stop. Um, it's like a business as usual, embedded throughout what we're gonna do um, going forward. Um, it might look differently as we respond um, and adapt along this very long journey of community land ownership and um, the community own the valley in perpetuity. And um, so obviously what we, how we engage now might look different, you know, in 10 years, um, but voices will always be um, heard and valued. There's no exact right way to do it and we, can recognize we probably won't always get it right and um, but the core part is that we're really transparent encourage open discussion and involvement throughout um anything we do and again it's forever project it's long term um and we know that the hard work really starts now um we're starting to develop a different sort of model to what's gone before here so uh, we have a really huge diverse range of skills in the community uh, within the team and um, through all the local networks um, and all the people that have supported us to be able to draw on this to be able to continue to make this a, you know a success and a really powerful example of um the, the benefits of a community-led approach. So I'll just go on to our action plan next. How are we uh, putting this community-led approach into uh, practice? So we've been really busy the last few months um, since uh, the buyout, um, the transfer of the secondary of the Terrace Valley. We've been really busy um, with a, a really varied program of community engagement to start developing our five-year action plan. Um, so we know we can't do it all, even though we really probably want to, uh, we can't do it all. Uh, so setting out our collective priorities together, we can't do it all at once. Um, so it's just um, starting to decide together, um, you know, what are the key areas we want to focus on in the next five years, setting out our collective priorities um, and, and, you know, getting a focus uh, in terms of what are the things that we want, to, um, you know, what are, what how do we reflect uh, the needs and the aspirations of the, of the community and what we do next? So we've had a really big focus through our events on just getting conversations going on all the different themes um, for an integrated action plan. So you can see in that um, top corner there, um, everything from access, nature, restoration, education, ecotourism, food, housing. So it really has sort of covered everything. Um, events have been everything from schools, uh, workshops, focus sessions, community drop-ins. Um, you can see here uh, drop-ins at the co-op, drop-ins at the community uh, produce market in Langham. Um, sort of really trying to sort of reach out to people um, and, and get people's ideas and get people what is, and you know, find out what's really important to people. Um, and I think it was, it's very much been about refreshing our mandate uh, with the community, revisiting previous work. Um, are things, certain things still relevant? Um, 
are there change priorities um, and really sort of um, refreshing the focus. So, for example, this time round, um, uh, while we've when, as we've started doing um, the engagement in um, the last couple of months, food and food growing, community food growing, started to become a really big theme in the feedback we've been getting locally. So it's it's um, you know than it has been before. So there's lots of things that are sort of coming up um, within our feedback that um, it's now how do we respond to that and how do we develop those kind of things going forward. Um, and we've been working really closely with other organisations in, in Langham and um, joining in with the town's community plan refresh, really making sure we're anchored in um, to the wider town plans and aspirations. Um, and the main thing is that these are, you know, um, in the early stages, these plans guide us, but uh, we need to recognise that they're going to be very iterative. Things are uh, changing very quickly um, and will require ongoing collaborative development um, as we're sort of evolving and learning together through this um, journey of uh, land community land ownership. Um, so next we will be talking about the work we've been doing under our four uh, key pillars of people, nature, climate and sustainability and how we've been and what kind of projects we've been doing um, to meet those um, sort of high level objectives. Uh, so I'll now hand on to Kat to cover what's been happening with our outreach work. Thanks, Jenny. So um, over the last, well, year and a half, two years. Um, we've been doing loads of stuff with all sorts of members of the local community, as well as um, with wider groups um, on a regional, national, and even the international scale. So um, starting with the environmental education and outdoor education program, um, all of the local children between the ages of three and 16, which is over 350 individuals, have all had the opportunity to um, take part in sessions run either directly on the nature reserve or locally in the town, um, doing a variety of activities, including things like mini beast hunts, stream dipping, bird watching, den building, fire lighting, um, all sorts of different activities that are all um, based around wildlife or just outdoor learning, um, as well as with the older students doing things um, related to biology, the biology curriculum, so um, various ecological surveys and that kind of thing. Um, within um, the schools and um, local young people, we've also had um, individuals doing work experience placements with us. So um, we have one individual at the moment who's been coming out every Wednesday um, and helping with some of the other engagement sessions with other school groups and um, doing other activities such as making um, barn owl boxes. Um, we've also been working with older students, so over the last um, year or so, we've had over 100 students visiting from Exeter and Bangor universities who have added um, visits to the Terrace Valley Nature Reserve as part of their um, curriculum within their courses. So um, they've been, they and they're wanting to make it into an annual thing, so um, we've already had both of them come back for a second trip and they're hoping to continue this in the future and come for even longer each time. Um, we're also looking at um, developing rural skills and employability in the 16 to 25 age range. So um, this includes working with um, students from the local academy doing, um, as I say, things like ecological surveying, um, bushcraft activities, practical conservation activities, um, and also working with um, school leavers and um, taking on older volunteers. Um, within the volunteering programme, we have a brilliant group of volunteers that we absolutely couldn't um, do all of the work that we've been doing without. So um, in the last year, over a thousand hours of volunteer time have been put into doing a range of different activities, including things like dry stone walling, um, Sitka spruce clearance on the moorland, planting trees, and they also take part in a lot of citizen science activities. So um, think the, the local raptor group um, monitor things like the hen harrier population and do other bird surveys. And there's also um, moth trapping that gets um, done on the reserve and um, ancient tree inventory with the, uh, with the Woodland Trust. Um, there's um, people studying bryophytes and plants and invertebrates and all sorts of different things on the reserve contributing to our um, ecological survey results. So that was what we've done in the last 12 months, but looking forwards, 
um, we want to maintain the focus on environmental education within schooling, school age children. So um, that includes um, just continuing to make sure that they get all of the local children get the opportunity to work with us, as well as expanding that slightly out with the local area, just um, to other places in Dumfries and Galloway and things like that. And um, even further away, depending on whether people are willing to travel to the nature reserve, but also um, trying to develop a wider range of um, develop rural skills and support wider employability opportunities. So this might include things like providing apprenticeship opportunities or um, longer term work experience placements for near or recent school leavers so that they get the opportunity to um, stay in Langdon while still learning about um, rural crafts or if they wanted a job, wanted to go into the countryside industry. Um, we also are looking at um, widening our um, volunteering op um, pro program by offering um, increased opportunities. Um, one of the things we are looking at is things like having a volunteer bunkhouse um, potentially on the reserve so people can come and stay on the reserve um, and volunteer while they're here. And so that means that we can have people not only locally and regionally, but nationally and international volunteers coming to visit the area, stay in Langham, stay on the reserve and help contribute to the running of the nature reserve. We also work along other local organizations in the town to provide support and opportunities to collaborate. So that includes things like um, organizations such as the Excel project, which works with um, young people and Creation Mill, which um, focuses on the textile industry. Um, and excellent work is being done by these projects and what we're linking, we're wanting to link with them to increase the town wide offer and maximize our collective impact across the whole area. Um, we're also looking at developing more income streams through engagement. So whether this is um, corporate volunteering groups um, coming. So, for example, we had Arcadus visit in the last year and they brought um, a huge group and they all did Sitka spruce removal on the um, reserve or um, and um, looking at how we can bring in income through the engagement to um, allow us to continue to provide the education aspect of the reserve for free. So um, I'll pass back to Jenny, who will talk more about what um, nature and climate things we've been doing. Thanks, Kat. Uh, so on the nature theme, um, since the community took uh, ownership of the Terrace Valley, like everything, there is a massive tendency to want to rush in and try and start changing everything and managing everything. Um, but what we've been really doing, um, we've been obviously doing the most critical things in terms of um, action on the ground. Um, but what's been so important is to stay, take stock uh, and start to understand, uh, understand the land. And so we've been doing that um, through some of the things that Kat mentioned, citizen science, uh, paid sort of ecological time for monitor monitoring, survey, baselining. Uh, we've also been using drone flyovers to start to baseline the area. Uh, so we really start to understand the land to shape what's next. Uh, we've had some really fantastic results. So for example, some of the moth trapping we've done and we've been finding moths that people didn't think existed in the region. So there's been loads of finds like that that have been something we wouldn't have known um, if we hadn't been starting to do this kind of like the basic, um, you know, the baseline monitoring. And going forward, it's going to be really helpful to start to understand you know how things are responding to um management and how things are being restored and 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 how species are responding um over time um so that's really important uh start storm arwen hit langham quite severely uh so in december 21 so we have really large areas of trees and forestry that were blown down in the area and obviously on on um, the terrace valley as well so we've been really busy uh, the last year working with the community to fell a uh, large plantation and restore that back to open native woodland and wetland areas so that's um that plantation is pictured in the bottom corner there being replanted so there's been a huge volunteer effort from someone who, Sam, who busked uh, to raise all the money for our trees that we replanted here, right the way through to all the community volunteering days we've had to replant that site, um, including all the schools who've come along and helped us to replant the native trees on the area. Uh, so wildlife's already rushing back into this. We've got wetland scrapes that are filled with ponds, uh, with tadpoles, 
um, and regenerating oaks already pushing back through the soils here. So it's just incredible to see what is coming back just with them, you know, just in the short space of time. And thanks to Scottish Forestry and the Woodland Trust, we're now, we've now set up a native tree nursery. So that's been a really exciting thing for us. Um, and the main aim obviously is to grow our own seeds from the valley. We've already started to harvest. I say the collective we, cat and volunteers, I haven't actually had anything to do with that, uh, but they've been harvesting the acorns from our ancient oak woodlands that which are next to the town. And we're starting to grow them at the nursery alongside lots of other trees. And the idea is that obviously then we, you know, we have a sort of um, a native stock of trees that we can use for our own woodland creation. But it also provides lots of wider social and economic benefits as uh, like with an enterprise like that. Um, and as Kat mentioned, we have been busy doing lots of practical volunteering, managing invasive, invasive species like the Sitka spruce trees that are um, reseeding across the land uh, coming in from nearby plantations so that's pictured just in the top uh, corner there we've been doing plenty of that um, as well as uh, doing things like uh, building new nest boxes for our resident owls do you want to go to the next slide cat uh, so the year ahead is looking like a very busy and exciting one for us uh, there's certainly a lot going to be happening so uh, the big things we're working on, a quick fly through of those, um, ancient woodland management. So I mentioned um, on the other slide about our ancient oak woodlands, which are located right next to Langham. Um, so the trees we've got in there are hundreds of years old. They're an incredibly precious um, you know, asset for us, but they need to be looked after. Um, so the big focus of our ancient woodland management working alongside the Woodland Trust um, is giving those magnificent veteran oak space and light. At the moment, there's been a lot of regenerating birch, which is brilliant, but they are um, crowding out the ancient trees. So we're going to be doing some halo thinning of encroaching birch, and that's planned for later in the year with potential for partnerships with local rural colleges as well um, as we continue with that work. We're also hoping to be trialling some conservation grazing with cattle. So a really big a uh, theme in our community feedback is people would like to see cattle and other conservation grazing to help us restore those natural processes on the land. It's been a huge theme. I've, if I had a pound for the amount of time people have said that to us. So we're really keen to sort of start taking that forward and looking at obviously the really big benefits with helping to um, create those habitat mosaics if it's the right, you know, the right grazing in the right places. So we're really excited about that. And we're obviously continuing to be uh, continuing our work removing Sitka spruce across the land. We're also working um, to apply for Nature Scots Nature Recovery Fund. Uh, so we've got some early development money working alongside the RSPB and Southern Uplands Partnership and the Woodland Trust with other partners across South Scotland to look at how we can create regional habitat corridors to support recovery of species like black grouse. So fingers crossed we're successful with that bid, um, which will fund capital works on the ground. We're also going to be busy felling 38 hectares of Sitka spruce monoculture. So that's on the southern end of the reserve. So that's been damaged by storms, uh, the storm Arwen I mentioned earlier. Uh, so we're going to be felling that and restoring that land to native broadleaf with a focus on where we have ancient woodland remnants that are um, sort of tucked away underneath those quite densely planted trees. Uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to sort of restore all those lost habitats that are hopefully sitting in the soil underneath all those trees. We're also going to be expanding our tree nursery. So again, continuing to harvest seeds from across the reserve and expand our uh, growing. And we are looking, we're in the very early days of scoping a wetland creation project with the local Rotary and Rotary International um, group. And we've just before I move on, we've been every, the, the Golden Eagles have been creating quite a buzz in the area when they've been visiting from the uh, south of Scotland Golden Eagle project. So we're really hoping we will continue to see those eagles soaring above um, the Taras Valley over the next year as well. So just on to the next theme, which is climate. So a quick snapshot of what we've been doing and what's coming up on climate. Um, we're really keen to make our ambitions a reality on this one. Uh, so we've the 
really bit one of the really big things we've been working on is with Scotland's National Peatland Action Programme and the Crichton Carbon Centre that are based over in Dumfries with a lot of expertise on peatland restoration. So they have been busy surveying and assessing the condition of our peatlands across the reserve and, and, and really looking at how we can restore that land from becoming a carbon source to a carbon sink and obviously all of the amazing benefits that that provides once um, that land is restored um, and, and the sort of natural hydrology of the area is restored. So interventions on the ground um, will be everything from blocking ditches. We have a huge network of artificial ditches across the moorland. Um, so th that's a big focus on that and rewetting the moorland areas. Um, and also this is a drone flyover of the headwaters of the Taras Valley, which is in community ownership. So you can see there's a lot of bare peat and a lot of bare ground there. So obviously that is washing into rivers. That is a, a carbon source at the moment. So uh, there'll be there's a lot of expertise within those organisations to help us look at how we can stabilise that ground and help to restore it. So um, if everything goes to plan, we'll be looking at works on the ground by 2025 for that one. So that's really exciting. Um, and we are continuing to work on a collaborative design workshop uh, uh, on collaborative design and workshops uh, on developing proposals for a new 30 hectare native broadleaf low density woodland with the Woodland Trust and obviously using our nursery grown saplings for the scheme, which is a nice sort of circular circular cycle for that one. Um, and we're continuing to work with the Scottish Government and CivTech and Rethink Carbon um, as a pilot site for trial and carbon mapping app development. And I'll now hand on to Ange to cover sustainability. Thanks very much for that, Jenny. Um, I think, as, as Jenny said earlier, um, this is, we're at the really early start of our journey. Um, and just as social and environmental sustainability is important, so, so are the finances, because this is a forever project. We have to make sure that we leave this for all our um all the future children of Langham, of all the future residents of Langham, we've got to leave this in good shape financially, socially and environmentally. So we want to reduce our reliance on grant aid. Um, if, if you look at the finances um, of the organisation or of this, this particular project, probably about half our income at the moment does come from grant aid. Um, other income comes from agricultural subsidies, rents um, and sales, as well as some donations and gift aid. Um, so we need to try and diversify this more so we are bringing in income from different sources. Um, the last year, just as with um, the sort of nature and with climate, there has been a lot of taking stock of understanding the land, of understanding the buildings, so we get a feel of what the potential is and, and what can be achieved. And it has been doing survey work like housing needs survey, the preparation work on peatlands or for felling the um, area of commercial sick that we have. But what's also really important is just as we're looking at our financial sustainability that we want benefits to come back to the town. So we want to see that the land and the properties can bring people back to the area to visit and stay. And at a very conservative um, estimate, we've probably brought in about £16,000 over the last year in hiring venues, uh, local accommodation and uh, people using the local restaurants. Now, that's a very conservative estimate of what we've been able to measure. And that's not the hugest amount it could be, but we know that will start to increase in the future. Um, and also just with our activities on the land itself, um, over 40,000 has been invested in local um, businesses, local tradespeople, local contractors. Again, probably a bit of a conservative estimate, but hopefully that will grow in the future as well. Um, so although the small scale contributions, we do want to see them grow. Um, we've also, um, been spending time just in our rental properties um, because it's really important that the reserve is providing a home for people as well as for wildlife and we'll build on that in the future as well. 
plus the day-to-day -day managing of Coombs Farm, which we took ownership of um, in November, and that is part of the income streams um, in the immediate term. So that's a little snapshot of what's been happening over, over the past year or so. Um, but looking forward to the future, um, Kat, if you want to move us on. Um, we will be carrying on with things like the um, development of the um, peatlands, because besides the, the benefits that brings to the climate, um, that does bring opportunities for um, looking at how we might be able to benefit from things like carbon credits. But there's so many of these areas that are a very new field for all of us, and we are really um, moving with care because we want to identify best options. Um, it's a difficult area to navigate ethically, so we're moving ahead on areas like that very, very cautiously. But we do have a number of other development projects as well. Um, we have um, a colleague working on some of our key properties, looking at how we can aim to generate income from them and associated land, in particular, Broomhome Shields Farmhouse and the steadings around it, um, Cranksbank Farmhouse and Lodge Gill. Um, some of you will be familiar with these from the original sort of business plan and original prospectus that we produced at the start of the, the buyout. Um, these are all identified in the early feasibility study, but with the action plan, what we are doing is making sure that the mandate's still there. And we're also to see if, if new ideas are coming through that we can incorporate and review what the income generation potential might be. Um, what we are looking for is to have um, a sort of diverse range of incomes coming in in the future, some large, some small. Um, some very focused on activity, on the reserve, on the buildings, but bringing people in and, as we said earlier, making sure that not just the reserve benefits, but the, the town as well. One of the priorities we want to do over the next year as well is to make sure that we've actually got some basic visitor infrastructure on the reserve. Um, at the moment now, if you, if you come to visit, um, even finding somewhere to park or signage, um, these are all areas that are quite a high priority for us to improve so that we can actually welcome people to the land and help and help you all enjoy it as much as possible. Um, a further priority project um, for moving forward is um, work on one of our empty properties. Um, that we're looking at um, developing it into residential accommodation, but trying to do that um, to the highest, um, highest standard in terms of trying to achieve net zero. And we want to use that so that we can learn lessons from that, that we can apply to many of our other properties as well. Um, and also share that any information and knowledge from that with people in the town as well, whether or not that's just local folk who want to um, see what they can do to insulate their properties or other, other local landlords as well. So we can share lessons that we've learned with uh, other people in the area. Bringing people onto the land um, to visit is really important. And as part of the kind of community plan, um, sort of local tourism is really important. We want bring, the town has so much to offer and we try and take an active part in the local tourism group to see how we can provide for visitors, how we can provide really good experiences so that people can learn about community land ownership or the activities that we're starting to develop on the reserve. So it's still very early days. Um, there is the temptation, as Jenny said, there's so many different strands that we can, we can follow and we do have to focus, we do have to prioritise and make sure that we can bring sustainable income streams um, into the into the Taurus Valley Nature Reserve and make sure that we can move forward as an organisation and be financially viable. So I'm now going to introduce Inigo um, to tell us a little bit more about his work as our digital media manager. Um, as we have seen, um, our face-to-face -face engagement in the local area is really important but uh, we are also really keen to broaden our audience uh, and to share uh, our message, our message uh, through digital media. So these are the 
different ways that uh, we've been doing that. Uh, we, we are developing a new website. Uh, we've uh, created a plan uh, for social media uh, to try to reach uh, international, national, and local audiences. Uh, we are, uh, we've got a new, new brand guidelines uh, that we have to develop for the Terras Valley. Uh, we have appeared uh, in over a hundred press uh, articles and several. Um, we have featured in uh, several UK and international podcasts and uh, numerous uh, broadcast media. We are trying uh, the drone uh, mapping uh, to help uh, in many ways the work uh, we are doing and to monitor uh, the, how the, the change that we are creating uh, uh, in the landscape. Um, and then we are uh, showing uh, uh, or trying to get uh, images of wildlife. So we've got hen harrier tag, tagging with created a YouTube uh, channel for our owls, uh, bird owls uh, that we put cameras inside and outside the nest so we can see how uh, they do. Uh, and we are uh, trying to get as much uh, footage possible from trial cameras to see what, what is the wildlife there is in the reserve. Um, and, and now I hand over to Mary, I think. Thank you, uh, Inital, and, and thank you to everyone, all the, the whole team for that snapshot of what has been a, a roller coaster year, really, and it's been amazing what has been achieved in such a short time. With such a small team, and we really have a very exciting year ahead. Um, if you would like to continue to help us on our journey, there are many ways you can support us, both you know, from sharing our message, volunteering with us, continuing to donate, and we really have appreciated all those who have donated to us so far. Um, as John said in his welcome, we couldn't have done it without done this without all our supporters and funders, both big and small. And it, it, it's really wonderful, you know, it's real proof that of the, the wonderful things that, that can happen when everybody comes together and works together, all of the things that can be achieved. So thank you very much for listening. And we're now going to take some questions and apologize, apologies if we don't get a chance to answer them all, but we will get back to you. Um, Kat's going to uh, read out the questions and I'm going to allocate them to one of the team. So, um, Pat, do you want to just kick off with some questions? Okay, so the first question is, um, is there anything you would say to community groups at the start of their journey? Thank you, Kat. I don't, I'm going to actually allocate that to Angela because I know that she has so much experience of working with communities, not just in Langham, but elsewhere in a previous working life. Um, oh, I think it's remembering that the hard work is is worthwhile. Um, it's not easy. Uh, I think with I think with any community who's who's gone on this journey, you, you have your highs and your lows, and there are times when you really do think, is this all worthwhile? Is it going to work out? But I do think if you have if you have the support of a local community, and I, I do mean. As, the, the, as many people as possible that it's not just like a small sort of interest group if it's if you've got that support there as your backdrop then please please persevere it is worth it and I think the benefits of realizing that you you become incredibly powerful when you own the land you are there to make a difference to the community and that ownership is 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 huge so so stick with it plan um don't give up um enjoy the highs you'll get through the lows and it really is worthwhile thank you angela i think i would just add to that that 
reach out to other communities that have gone mm. before. There's a huge amount to learn. There's a huge amount of experience there all over, certainly all over Scotland. And I think we've, you know, networked um, recently, Jenny and uh, Margaret Poole, who's a, a an initiative board member, went to the Western Isles to Harris and met up with colleagues from other parts of Scotland too. And, and discussed various aspects of community land ownership and some of the things others have achieved. So networking, I believe, is really important for community land ownership and going forward as a small community group. And you gain a lot of strength, I think, from your colleagues um, who have done this before or who are on the same journey as you. I think that's true. OK, Kat, over to you. Um, do you have any issues with deer or are the num numbers not significant? Um, I think Jenny's probably the pers best person to go to for that yeah. question. <laughs> um, the honest answer at the moment is we know we have a roe deer population. Um, that, that, that's, we don't have red deer in the area. Um, so, but we, in terms of sort of grazing pressure, I think one of the things we mentioned earlier about is monitoring. So one of the things uh, we're going to commission in the next year is a herbivore impact assessment just to look across the landscape holistically uh, where is undergrazed where's overgrazed are there any areas of pressure to really get that data set to inform anything in the future um, at the moment we've we really do need the data on that one so I think mm -hmm. that and then that obviously will underpin any kind of management action so um, yeah the answer is we at the moment we we don't really um, have the evidence. So yeah, it's very much about getting that. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. I think we'd, we're very keen to have a sort of evidence-based approach to how yeah, we manage definitely. the land and, and the nature that's upon it. Okay, thank you, Kat. Have you got another question? Yeah. Um, how will you undertake the Sitka spruce removal without compacting the soil and destroying the seed bank? Thank you. Um, again, I think Jenny's probably the best person to answer this. Uh, we do have a lot of Sitka spruce that have self-seeded across the land. So, Jenny. <laughs> well, so far, the removal of the Sitka, um, a lot of it obviously is on the prevailing winds. Some of it is in very hard to access areas and we've got it seeding from very small right the way up to quite big trees that have grown over the years. Um, so the removal at the moment has been done by corporate volunteering groups, volunteer sessions um, with hand uh, tools. It's been and we for a while tried to take it all off and chip it, but it's very difficult to get it off at some areas of the land. So um, to really get on top of it, we're applying for money at the moment uh, to try and get uh, contractors in to come and start clearing it. Um, so. It'll all done be it'll all be done by hand. We're not sort of removing it with any sort of heavy machinery or anything like that. It's sort of um mm -hmm. it, it's sparse, it, it's it's quite far spaced across the land, but there's a lot of it. So I think we, you know, we recognize we need more than volunteers to 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 deal with the problem. Um in terms of destroying the seed bank, um the, the main thing is that we, it's not sort of uh, disturbing the soil, it's all sort of above ground and done by by hand. Uh, so that's the main, um, you know, mm -hmm. love heavy machinery. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Pat, have you got another question? I can see there's more yeah. coming up in the chat box. Yeah, um, I'll just skip a couple for now. I will come back to them. But this one's going back to the um, question about the deer. Could you use drone and thermal imagery to monitor the deer population? Um, I think I'm going to ask Inigo to uh, answer that one if he can. <laughs> Uh, in principle, we should be able. Um, <clears throat> I'm still uh, trying to trying a bit the the drone and see how we can best uh, use it. Um, I would say that is the plan. You know, we can just take off. Uh, fly the drone and uh, and see, try to count, you know, how many uh, deer or sheep or goats, whatever. Uh, I'm still learning how to use properly the drone and how we can use best the thermal camera. Thank you. 
uh, I would thank say, it's early you. days. Thank you, Inigo. Hopefully that answers that person's question, but if not, maybe they can come back in the chat box. Kat? This one is also about the drone. Um, are there issues with disturbance? And if so, how is it mitigated? Um, I, I don't see any issues with that. Uh, I'm still trying in one small area in Ronfeld. Um, and there, uh, the takeoff and landing area is in the road. So I just uh, fly the drone and I can do a mapping of the area without even uh, setting a foot uh, in the pitlands and damaging more or, you know. So I think it's the other way. It's, it's just a, 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 an amazing tool to do that. Uh, without doing any damage at all. And just in terms of the bird we birds at the moment, um, obviously we've got hen harriers returning, lots of different bird life. We mm -hmm. avo we're avoiding those sort of hotspot areas with the drone at the moment. Um, Thank you, uh, Inigo and uh, uh, Jenny there. Um, Kat, have you got another question? Yep, I'll read this whole um, comment. So congr firstly, congratulations on the huge amount of engagement face-to-face -face and digitally you've achieved, which is lovely. Um, to continue on the journey, do you have a vision of how your team will need to develop in years to come? Thank you. Um, Angela, would you like to take that question? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, yeah, we, we are a, a small team at the moment um, and we do support each other a lot. So although we all have our own sort of individual specialisms we we do work very well together and um complement each other's skills and support each other um there's no doubt that there are uh, additional there is scope for um additional posts within the team mm -hmm. um but i think it's it's careful that we it's important that we grow carefully and we grow st sustainably as well so um in the current budget round that we're looking at, we are looking at the possibility of um, maybe employing somebody to assist with practical work. Um, but there, is there are plenty more opportunities, um, but we've got so much to do at the moment. And there's a little bit about consolidating and sort of not trying to run too fast and bringing lots more people on board. So I think it's trying to kind of consolidate um, as well as identifying key priorities for, for new staffing posts in the future. And sometimes, it, you know, it might be being a bit optimistic, op opportunistic if um, the opportunity comes along, but it needs to be fitting in with the vision and not distracting us from the kind of core activity we're doing. Yeah. And, and maybe I'd just add, I think it's important that um, everyone in the team, but also on the board, understands why, you know, community engagement is really important in terms of sustainability. You know, we need to keep engaging all the, the way through. So th that philosophy is really important, I think, for, for everyone, isn't it? OK, Kat. <laughs> um, does your development planning take into account that climate change may affect this area too? If so, how will this be implemented? For example, will native trees be supplemented with more robust varieties? Um, I'm going to come to Jenny on that one. I think probably Storm Arwen was maybe a good example of uh, climate change that we've seen most recently. As Jenny said, it brought down a lot of trees around Langham. Um, uh, we've not seen a storm like that for a long, long time here. But Jenny can probably answer that question better. Um, so yeah, if we'll just uh, I'm just looking at the question. So it's about well, sort of climate change adaptation and 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 sort of looking at how climate change might affect us in the future. So we are working with the Woodland Trust in terms of like, well, we source the seeds from um, one ecological seed zone at the moment, so that they're ecologically sort of can adapt a lot more more quickly to the area. But that might need to change in the future if we start to see warming climate. We might we might need to expand the seed zones that we take trees from or that we'll accept trees from. Um, so I think you know as we learn more about the landscape and we we are doing a, a sort of woodland creation project at the moment i think we are going to need to 
adapt um, as we go forward. Um, so right now we are just sourcing seeds from um, Seed Zone 109 and obviously our local um, seeds for the trees. But that, you know, recognising that we are definitely going to have to adapt on that one if things start to fail or we need to be more resilient. Um, and then wider than that, obviously, um, you know, future climate change in terms of our planning and um, the more we can sort of restore the landscape to naturally cope with increasing sort of more extreme weather and um, the better. So rewetting our landscapes, uh, more trees so that the landscape can um you know, be more resilient to, you know, a wetter, warmer climate. Um, the more we can do that, um, the better. So hopefully the projects that we've got in development are really going to help with future climate change adaptation. Uh, it's it, we, don't, we definitely don't have all the answers, but, you know, certainly I think it's back to the networks, getting the right advice, making sure that we're being really, um, you know, really due diligence on that one and making sure we're asking the question with everything we're doing. Thank you, Jenny. Um... Pat, the next question, please. Yeah. Um, just in case it hasn't been noticed, there was a couple of questions about donating and corporate volunteering that I've um, typed answers to, just um, Thank you. to keep it quicker. Um, so the next question, do you have good relationships with neighbouring estates? Um, well, I, I can answer just, that one, Mary. Yep, oh. that's great, Jenny, thank you. <laughs> Um, yep. Yeah, so we've got lot, we've got quite a few different neighbours. Um, so everything from sort of commercial forestry, uh, tenanted farms, uh, new neighbours, um, oxygen conservation. So that we've got quite a diverse range of neighbours. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got really good. You know, we've got good relationships with. You know, with some of them are newer neighbours and others we might not have met them yet. Uh, but in terms of the existing neighbours we've got, we're working really well with them. So for example. Uh, back to the storm Arwen um we've got some commercial plantations that adjoin us and we've been uh, myself and um, Jane from the Woodland Trust have been working with those two big commercial plantations to look at once they've re they've been fell in the Sitka spruce which adjoins our land can we put native woodland buffers and open ground back in to kind of help to mitigate future sort of seed dispersal whether that's going to work or not we don't know but it you know, they've been very willing to work with us when they've been restocking and putting back native trees to border the reserve. Mm -hmm. So we've got some really good examples of where we've been sort of actively working with our neighbours to, you know, broaden the impact past our boundaries and, and, you know, provide those wider benefits beyond our sort of land ownership boundaries. Thank you, Jenny. Um, Kat, is there anything else? Mute, Kat. I was trying to unmute and it wasn't working. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> you mentioned having a bunkhouse volunteers from further afield, but will it be possible to provide camping with a shower block as well? Well, I think uh, the creation of glamping pods or glamping was in our original uh, business plan. Um, so I'll, I'll go over to Angela for that one. Um, it certainly hasn't hasn't been ruled out, um, and it's you know obviously providing. Um, Camping and facilities is a great way of encouraging people to come and uh, sort of experience the land. So um, it's certainly something that will be looked at. I can't can't guarantee when, um, but yeah, it's it's certainly one of the um, activities that's that's in the mix. Thank you, thank you. Um, anything else, Kat? Coming up? Yep. So, um, have you talked to John Your Trust about low impact removal of trees? Um, their exp experience at Glenlude may be helpful. Question. Well, we've, we've had someone who was working for the John Muir Trust on our board, the, the Langham Initiative Board. I'm not sure if uh, staff are aware of what's happened at Glen Lude, but uh, Jenny maybe can tell us. Um, we will certainly be happy to uh, share any, um, you know, any kind of good tips you've got with the sort of low yeah. impact removal of any trees. I'm really yeah. keen to share anything, any good tips you've got. Um, that would be great. I'm much Thank appreciated. <laughs> Thank you. Kat, have we yep. worked our um, way through the... There's another question just come in. So um, I was interested and impressed to see that your engagement um, covers a wide range of ages right up to undergraduate level. Are there any plan in Scotland um, to introduce something like a natural history GCSE in development? In, to Like the natural history GCSE in development in England that you can further mm -hmm. engage with? 
I don't point. know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that either. It's definitely a rural <laughs> skills class. Certainly really interesting. Yeah, the, um, um, there's, there is definitely a rural skills class that some mm -hmm. of the students are taking in the academy. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know whether there is a natural history one going ahead, but um, I can certainly find no, out that from the thing. school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there are also courses, uh, we, we've been in contact with the Barony College who runs some conservation courses. Jenny, is that correct? Uh, yeah, we have done so. We've been in sort of outline discussions with Barony and potentially another rural college uh, in the area to look at how we can kind of become like a sort of outdoor classroom for some of their uh, courses like uh, arboriculture or you know the tree surgeons the kind of practical rural skills so um you know that'll be really good that we can sort of build in contracting work with the wider learning yeah, so yeah. we're really yeah. really keen to keep that one um developed and make something happen with that well i think we've only got about a couple of minutes left so can i just say thank you to all the panelists and, and thank you to everyone who has joined us this evening and hopefully it's been useful for you all and that you've enjoyed hearing what's happening. We're really just at the start of a journey, I think, and, um, you know, a long way to go. And we really appreciate all the support that we have and uh, look forward to working with you and welcoming you here, if you've not been before, to let you see the Taras Valley Nature Reserve. So... Thank you very much. I think we're we're out of time, or, or, or more or less. I, I make it that anyway. I make it one minute to go. So, thank you, everyone. I don't know if anybody has any last things to say from on the panel. Just a big thank you for everyone yeah. for supporting us and joining. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot.